Yeah, so uh, since I was first, I thought that I might begin with a, a sort of overview of the way that uh, we at least like to think about computation and biology. And so uh, this had a, we had an exciting dinner table conversation last night where this was controversial apparently, so I'm ready for that. <laughs> so, so I like to think about the distinction between what we're doing in biology from what I used to do, say, in physics, is that the systems we're looking at I would like to frame as having, having intent of some kind. You look at a piece of matter and it's doing something and you can meaningfully ask the question, why is it doing what it's doing? You know, and why has it built itself in the way to carry out that, that, um, that action? And so when we address systems in biology uh, with analytical methods, physics is part of that, but another part of it may be uh, equally important, which is a more computer science, let's say, perspective. So when we define a computation, what we're trying to do is to say, what is that system trying to perform? What is the action, the algorithm that is being undertaken by the system? And the identification of the computation is something that is some, you know, at some level teleological, that we have to f discover that from, from on high, let's say. And then I think where, where physics comes into play is that we'd like to understand how that computation is affected by the, by the underlying system. And so to do that, we have our observations or our models, these high dimensional data that we're taking, maybe recordings from many neurons at the same time or being able to write down uh, extensive series of differential equations to de describe the dynamics of the system. And those are how that computation is, is carried out. Where again, physics comes into play is trying to understand what is the fundamental mechanism that carries out that, that uh, computation, right? So how do we go from this complicated real life instantiation of the computation to some kind of low dimensional model that reveals for us the basic mechanism of how that process is, is instantiated. And so all of these aspects, the, the, uh, the way we get between these different levels of description involve different kinds of analysis. So one is to be able to identify that computation. And you, we hear a lot uh, at the moment about big data, right? So how do, we, how do we infer what the computation that a system is trying to do uh, is? And one approach to that is to take lots of data, right? To, to make many, many measurements, and then to try to discover in that data what the relationship between the observations and the computation is. All right, so what are we working with? So here is uh, a beautiful uh, microscope view from Andreas Tolius' lab. And so here we're zooming into a chunk of brain. And you can see that different neuron types are lit up in different colors. Let me just play that again if I can. Um, you know, very complicated. Lots of uh, rather similar looking elements connected together in, in complicated ways. So that is the data that we're working with. And from that, we need to try to understand what that, what that piece of brain is trying to do. What, where I want to go today is to sort of zoom in on the individual elements, because this is a place where we might be able to really connect those, those three dots, right? It's the computational aspect, the real implementation in terms of ion channel dynamics, and some kind of low dimensional model for how the computation that the neuron is trying to do is carried out. As you all know, neurons are not simple uh, point processes, they're very complicated. So here's a Purkinje cell, I won't talk about anything this complicated, but that has an exquisite geometry. All of these, uh, all of these dendrites have active channels in it, they have nonlinear properties. They're summed together in nonlinear ways at the soma, and uh, an action potential is generated that then is the essence or the, the expression of the computation that that neuron has performed. When we think about things from the computer science or the engineering aspect, we want to reduce a system like that to something like a transistor or, you know, what is the component that a neuron like this is, is uh, representing, right? If we want to write down a circuit diagram, what, what is a neuron in that circuit diagram? And so what I want to talk about today is sort of how uh, we can take our understanding of biophysics, how can we take measurements to infer what that computation is, and hopefully to find reduced models that tell us how uh, that computation is being carried out by these nonlinear processes. All right, so ultimately I'd like to get toward a mechanistic understanding of the biology of computation, and in particular, what might the biophysics of different neuronal types contribute to computation? You know, a lot of the most beautiful work that we have in uh, 
in understanding neural computation is done in neural networks where all of those elements are assumed to be the same. In reality, they all have very different configurations of ion channels. One has the sense that there must be some reason for that. We can now experimentally access all of those different ion channel types using genetic tools. And so people are going after, you know, methods to silence particular neurons in a, in a circuit. So why do, they, why do they have that property and what, what can that contribute? You know, how, and then, so we'll look at um, single neurons, what they do, and how that's influenced by their, by their dynamics. And then how do these neuronal properties affect global information processing and network function? And I'll show you just one very simple example where, where there's a dramatic impact of the, the role of, of single neuron biophysics. All right. All right, so where we want to start is, you know, how do we, how do, we do this part? How do we identify the computation? And again, this is where experiments uh, are needed to, to try to find for us an appropriate model of a computation. And the model that has been the most prevalent in neuroscience and is very powerful is uh, that neurons, you know, one version of what neurons are doing, and this is true in the sensory system particularly, is representing information. Right? So that's a pretty basic computation. They're taking an input and they're re-representing that input in terms of a, a sequence of, of spikes. And the prevalent model for, for how we capture that computation is that there's some kind of complicated input coming in. The neuron is extracting from that input some feature, right? The feature can be, can be complex. It can be, uh, you know, a, a little spatial temporal movie or frequencies or whatever. Uh, given that feature, there's now some nonlinear relationship that maps the strength of that feature in the input to the probability of generating a spike. And now our spike train gives us a time-varying estimate of the strength of the neuron's preferred feature in the input. Right, so one can extend models like this to be a little bit more complex. It's very reasonable to think that a neuron might be able to extract multiple features from its input and combine those multiple features in some nonlinear way to produce, to produce an output like this. Right, so a model like this is very powerful that allows uh, us to think about a neuron as representing any arbitrary stimulus feature. And in general, we will learn what that arbitrary stimulus feature is from data. So we'll use sort of stochastic methods to sample the system and learn what that feature is. It's, they can be combined with, again, an arbitrary nonlinearity that we can learn from data. And now, given a model like that, we can quantify what might be changing, say, during development or uh, as the animal is learning or during simple sort of underlying processes like neuronal adaptation. So what we would like to do in order to connect the dots is to be able to go from uh, a case where we really know the underlying you know, dynamics of the system. In this case, if we're thinking about single neurons, the full description of the nonlinear ion channel dynamics and map such a description, right, our high dimensional model onto a coding model or a computational model of this type. So what is the relationship between system like this, which has been painstakingly worked out by, by measurements, and what we, I would like to think of as, as the, the model that expresses the fundamental computation of the neuron. So it turns out that if we go through this procedure and we stimulate neurons with many different kinds of inputs, we learn that they are computationally complex. Individual neurons, cortical neurons, have lots of dynamics that create all kinds of responses that are, that are interesting, right? So they're not just simple, you know, the model we typically use is an integrate and fire neuron that a, that a neuron takes in input, sums them up, and there's a threshold and it fires a spike. That is a very poor model for most types of neurons. Neurons are often multidimensional. They have multiple inputs that drive them to fire. They're adaptive. They show properties that allow them to change their, uh, the nature of their coding properties uh, dynamically as the stimulus changes. They're computationally robust, so this is a, a generic property of biology that many different implementations of, of specific physical systems can lead to the same computational output. So it's a sort of many to one mapping from parameter space to computational space. And they're modulatable, which means that all of their computational properties can be, can be altered uh, in real time by changing um, some property of the input or some property of the, of the biophysics. All right, so let's just sort of whip through a couple of those properties. Let me, let me demonstrate what I, what I mean. So multidimensional, let's have a look at an example of that. So here's a, a neuron from the auditory brainstem. 
I won't go into too much detail about, about what this is doing. This is part of the circuitry that allows animals to, uh, to locate objects in space by looking at precise timing differences between sound coming in from two ears. And so one would like to ask, well, what are these neurons exactly representing about their input? So what we can do is drive the neuron with a, with a complicated input, you know, some random process. We look at when the spikes happen, and from that we construct a coding model of the type that I showed you before, like this. And what we find is that you can build a model that has just one feature, but you do much better if you, if you allow the neuron to, uh, to have two features in its, in its input model, one of which is an integrator. Right? So you see that this feature is a time-varying feature. It's, it's basically summing up uh, the recent history of the, of the input. But there's a second mode that has a more differentiating um, nature. Right? So, so a feature like this is going to take the input in the in the recent past and subtract it from what happened uh, immediately. And so these two components work together, both an integration of the recent input and a differentiation to create uh, the neuron's probability to fire. And it turns out that you can manipulate certain ion channel dynamics and change the relative weights of this integrating feature versus the differentiating feature. So where are these features coming from? Just to give you a very uh, quick overview of you know, how we can think about this analytically, so if we just had a simple neuron model, uh, I'm drawing for you uh, an integrated and firing neuron model. So what I'm showing is if we write down the dynamics of the voltage of the neuron, dv dt, is some uh, linear function, right? So if we just had a passive membrane, that's, that's all we would have, plus some input. The most standard model that we have for single neuron dynamics, again, is the integrated and firing neuron, which is this. So the neuron integrates its input with this, with this linear filter. Uh, and then uh, when it hits some threshold, we fire, right? So that's, that's the basic model. In reality, many neurons are better described by something like this, right? There's an intrinsic nonlinearity to that subthreshold uh, behavior. When the neuron, uh, when the voltage goes above this threshold, there's, of course, an intrinsic dynamics that, that makes it fire. So if we take uh, something like this as a good model for what's going on sort of under the hood at the single neuron level, where do we get the feature from? So we can, we can look at this, and what we can ask is, so what is the best uh, nice linearization of this system? Right? So we, we've written down uh, a model like this, where now f of v is nonlinear. We want to find the best linear filter that describes the relationship between the spiking and the input. So one way to go about that is by linearizing f of v to find a kernel that is the most appropriate one to describe how the neuron is, is um, filtering its inputs. Right, so we can take that nonlinearity, linearize it around uh, the fixed point of the system, around the, the membrane resting voltage. And the slope of that line will tell us the time constant of the appropriate filter for that system. So how do we get two-dimensional dynamics out of this? Of course, that is appropriate when we only have uh, one equation that describes the voltage. In general, of course, when we see even the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron, we see that there are many equations. So the, uh, the true uh, system describing the neuron is, is multidimensional. Generally, not all of those variables matter toward taking the voltage toward the, the threshold, but some uh, subset of them do. And their appropriate linearizations will form the basis in which the features of the neuron live. Right, so what we can do, and what we've done, uh, what these red curves are showing, is where we've taken a case, uh, this particular case for the uh, neurons in this, in this auditory brainstem area, it's maybe a 16-dimensional dynamical system. We can analytically reduce it to two dimensions. We can then find the appropriate linearized filters that, are, that describe that two-dimensional system. And now we, we see that they, they match pretty well with the observed. Uh, you remember all of this was gathered from data analysis, now we can analytically predict what the shape of those, of those filters look like from analysis of the, of the dynamical system. All right, so what we learn from that is that uh, the basis of potential features that neurons typically are representing will be built from linearizations of multidimensional dynamical systems, right? So they have a, they have a structure, right? We can get integrators, that is, if we have uh, filters that are purely, purely um, decaying. But if we have eigenvalues that are, that are complex, we can get things that oscillate. So we can get neurons that are resonators. If they have an appropriate combination of damping and oscillation, then we get something like a differentiator that goes, undergoes one cycle before it, before it dampens down. 
And so the space of features of single neurons is fairly well captured by this idea of sort of linearization of the, of the nonlinear dynamical system. All right, so we've learned about multidimensionality. Uh, neurons are also adaptive, and that is not, it's, you know, I will show you that that's true at the single neuron level, but we know that that's true at the systems level. Why is that? Well, the natural environment varies on many time scales, and neural systems are restricted to a certain range of, of firing. You know, here's some examples of natural signals. Uh, if we look around the visual environment, the light level, the contrast are changing by orders of magnitude as we go from inside to outside or as I look around the room. Yet the fidelity with which we see, we feel uh, approximately stays constant, right? You can look outside, you see things perfectly well as you look back inside. So we're instantaneously able to adjust our dynamic range to the properties of the scene. You know, if, unlike your, say, iPhone, if you take a picture of this scene, you'll see inside fine, but you won't see outside, it will be one sort of white blob. That's true also uh, if you look at, at properties of other natural inputs, uh, say an olfactory plume has huge variations of scale. You know, there's uh, fluctuations, again, on many time scales. The same with, uh, this is a, a sound wave, so there's lots of properties of the, of the frequency spectrum inside uh, the sound wave that we want to know about, but we also need to be relatively insensitive to the amplitude of that wave in encoding the, the details. All right, so how do we do that? Well, let's do some experiments. So here, um, we're looking at single cortical neurons and now just driving them with a current input that varies in overall amplitude. We'd like to see how the neuron responds to, uh, to an input like that. And so we're driving it with noise and just changing its amplitude. And what we see is that as you change the amplitude of the noise to be larger, the neuron will respond to that change with a large, uh, large burst of, of firing and then gradually decay. That's true also if we change the mean of the signal. So if we just put in a square wave current, you see the same kind of adaptive dynamics. Uh, as, you, as you drop it down, it, it um, drops down significantly and then recovers back. Uh, you change it up again, it will have a large burst and, and fall back again. Uh, turns out that if you repeat this same experiment, but with different time scales of the switch between the high and the low amplitude, the time scale that it takes to recover back to, um, to that amplitude also changes. So one might think that the neuron has some intrinsic time constant in which it, it, um, it, it it's needed to recover, but it turns out that that time constant is in fact governed by the time scales of the input itself. So if we change the period of that switch and we measure the effective time constant of that, of that recovery, you find that it scales with the period. Right, so that tells us that the neuron, in fact, has access to multiple timescales that are being accessed in different ways by different timescales of the stimulus. So we can see that again if we look, instead of uh, doing a step change in the stimulus, if we do a, a sinusoidal change. So here's, uh, in dotted lines, is how the, uh, amp the envelope of the, of the stimulus is changing. You see that the firing rate is lagging somewhat. And if we do this for multiple frequencies, we find that the phase difference between the input and the output is constant, which tells us again that there's a time scale that's varying with the time scale of the input. So it turns out that this is quite well described by a very simple transformation. Right? So if we take the envelope of the signal and we run it through uh, a fractional differentiator, then we get something that looks very much like uh, what cortical neurons are doing. So just to, how does that work? So if you look at it in Fourier representation, we can represent that. So if it were just a differentiator, the, uh, the Fourier transform of a differentiator is just I omega. If we have a fractional differentiator, there's uh, an exponent to that I omega, which is less than one. And so what we find for cortical neurons is that there is an exponent here that is um, about 0.15. Right? So that will give us uh, a case where every frequency component will be scaled by, by the frequency to, to that power and the phase will be shifted by a constant amount that's also uh, a function of that power. So let's just have a look at how that, how that works out for these cortical neurons. Let's evaluate that gain and phase shift as a function of frequency. So remember, we want to see a power law in gain and a constant phase. So here's the, here's the gain as a function of the period. If we now plot that in log log, we see this constant slope. You know, so that tells us that there's a single exponent that, that's capturing those dynamics. And if we pull out that number, here it's 0.16, here 0.15. And now let's look at the phase. So we see a nice constant phase-ish again with, with frequency. 
So this fractional differentiation model is a very nice um, compact description of how the neuron is what we thought of as adapting, right? So when we, I think when we use the word adaptation, we tend to think that the neuron is sort of getting tired or fatigued. But in fact, I think what this shows is that the, in, the um, responses that we're seeing with these multiple timescales is better thought about as being an encoding, a very specific encoding of the envelope itself. So it has a very clear and specific relationship with uh, the dynamics of the envelope. So in this case, uh, I'm showing you that this model, where all we've done is to put in that one parameter, the, 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 um, the exponent of the fractional differentiator, and we see that we get a beautiful fit to the dynamics of adaptation at three different timescales. I love this one. So here is where we're switching uh, the envelope from three different levels. And you see when you switch into this middle level from a higher uh, amplitude, you get an upward. Uh, upward dynamics to the adaptation. When you switch from a lower amplitude, you get a downward. So this level is the, is the same level. So complicated, right, uh, response. Again, if we just plug in uh, that one number and we run, uh, we run the envelope through our fractional differentiator, we get a, a very nice fit to the, to the dynamics of the adaptation. All right, so adaptation in this case, I think, is best thought about as sort of an additional layer of encoding. So the neuron, as you've seen before, is encoding fast fluctuations by pulling out features and, and having a firing rate that depends on the occurrence of these fast features in the input. But then there's this slow change in the overall firing rate, which has this very nice relationship with the, with the dynamics of the envelope. So we have sort of two layers of coding. Fast coding, in which single spike timing is depending on, on specific uh, details in the input, and then this overall slow modulation of the firing rate, which tells us about the dynamics of the envelope. All right, so let's look in more detail at what's going on with the fast changes, right? So I've told you before that their uh, neurons are capturing sort of features out of this fast fluctuating noise. Turns out that those features also depend on the statistics of the input. So this representation in terms of a feature and a decision function is also dynamic. These uh, features uh, we make sense, right, that the neuron is changing its effective linear, linear filtering properties as we change the input, and we also see changes in the effective thresholding properties. So let's see some examples at the systems level. So this is uh, old data from the retina. As one changes uh, the light level, this is uh, a Fourier representation of what the receptive field, the spatial receptive field of the neuron looks like. And so when the light level is low, as a function of, of spatial frequency, you see that the neuron is more or less an integrator, right? So it's just a, 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 a low pass filter. But as the light level goes up, you see that it becomes more and more band pass. So the neuron is sort of doing something that's more and more like edge detection as the signal to noise of the, of the image gets higher and higher. And so this is a case where as you change the statistics of the input, you're seeing a change in the, the filtering properties of the neuron and the kinds of features that are able to be represented. This is true in, in many other domains. So this is data from uh, V1, uh, now with respect to temporal changes in the stimulus. So now uh, the stimulus is a, is a visual stimulus that's changing in time. If you look at how the neuron is uh, representing information about the time variations in that signal, you see that there are different uh, temporal filters that again, as you change the contrast of the signal, gets shorter and shorter. So as the contrast gets higher, the kinds of features that are being extracted are shorter in time. So again, from, a, from an information representation point of view, that makes sense, right? So as the signal to noise, again, in the, in the signal, as this gets brighter, then the neuron is firing to kind of briefer and briefer representations of, of something in the image. So it's true also here in MT. Turns out that single neurons have a very similar property. So if you drive just a single hodgkin huxley neuron with current, uh, with different amplitudes, you also see that the, that the effective filtering properties of the neuron or the time scales of the feature that's being represented by the neuron also shorten. And we've been able to show that if we take, uh, we take models of neurons, again, that's very simple, sort of nonlinear um, subthreshold properties, we can actually reproduce very well uh, the, time, the effective time scales of the, of the filtering properties of the neuron. So we, you know, rather than, even though nothing about the underlying system has changed, right? It's the same neuron, it's the same nonlinearity. As you drive it with different stimuli, you're going to sample that nonlinearity in different ways, which is going to lead to a different effective time scale of the, of the feature representation of the neuron. 
So here's the spike triggered average, which is our estimate of what the filter of that neuron looks like. And using some analytical methods, we can, we can actually um, uh, derive what the, what the filtering time constant of that neuron should be as we change the contrast of the, of the input. All right, so that's what you've seen here is that uh, this property that the feature is adaptive is something that is able to be instantiated at the single neuron level rather than necessarily be a, a complex property of a circuit. That's true also for this other property that, um, that was something I looked at in Bill's lab uh, during, my, during my postdoc, Bill Bialik's lab. So here, uh, what we did, again, was to change the amplitude of the stimulus dynamically in time. And now what we want to look at is not the feature that's being represented, but the nonlinearity with which that feature is, is um, converted into spikes. So what one would expect is that, well, so what people have claimed is that neurons encode efficiently, right? So they have, systems have evolved over uh, evolutionary time or perhaps um, over development to encode the stimuli that they, that, that they most often see. And so they should use their dynamic range optimally to center it around the range that they typically see in the environment. What we saw was that, in fact, as you change those statistics dynamically, those properties are equally dynamic, that the neuron is constantly changing its effective dynamic range to match the, the, the local dynamics of the input. And so here what I've done is to pull out the, the mapping from input to spikes at different points in time throughout the presentation of a stimulus like this. And so what we see is that in these different windows, we get a completely different mapping from input to output as we move through that stimulus. Now, if we replot those stimuli such that uh, the stimulus is now plotted in terms of normalized units, we now divide out the range of the input or the sta local standard deviation, we see that's all the same curve, but the neuron has the, or the system has the flexibility to change the, the scale of that mapping from input to output. So this turns out to be a property that's quite prevalent through many uh, sensory systems. You know, it's, I think the, the key property here is that neurons are able to measure things in relative units. They're able to learn about the statistics of the environment in real time and to encode with spikes fluctuations in the environment relative to the local dynamics of, the, of that signal. We've seen this in, uh, in uh, rat barrel cortex. I won't go through that, but just yeah, when you have a, a large amplitude signal and a low amplitude signal, you get two different input-output curves, which again scale. Uh, with, the, with the standard deviation. What we found uh, a couple of years ago is that uh, we saw that neurons in cortex are actually able to do this at the single neuron level. So now if you take neurons and you drive them again with the current input directly and you change the amplitude of that current input, you get four different input-output curves. And now if we normalize them by the standard deviation of the current input, they all uh, scale onto the same curve. This turned out to be a property that only showed up over the course of development. So we were recording from neurons uh, from mice between day P0 around, around birth up to about P10. And at P0, this was not a consistent or, or um, well-expressed property in neurons, but by P10, all the neurons that we recorded uh, expressed this quite, quite strongly. And so since this is happening at the single neuron level, it gives us the opportunity to try to understand what do we need to have be true about the single neuron for this to, to work? And so all we've done here is to take a, a version of a mammalian cell, uh, where we, you know, Hodgkin-Huxley model, and now we vary the ion channel concentrations. And we look to see to what extent does it do this property? You know, can, if you drive it with two different variances and you compare the two curves for the two different variances, how different are they? And so what you're seeing here is a measure of how different the two curves are. It's colored by how different the variances of the inputs are. So the, the brighter the color, the more different the uh, amplitudes of the stimuli were. And so not surprisingly, the more different the inputs are, the more different the input-output curves are. But what you'll see is that as we change this ratio of, of ion channel conductances, uh, we see that these curves get more and more similar. And so here for anything with, uh, with a ratio of about one and above, all of these neuron models, independent of the, the precise choices of, of the two conductances, as long as their ratio is more than one, we get this property of, of gain scaling, that it's able to scale out the, the standard deviation of the input. 
And so that's an example, one could say, of neurons being computationally robust. There are many different choices of those underlying ion channel parameters that would lead to that same computation, the ability to, to measure inputs in relative units. All right, so just to show you what's happening during development, if we measure, uh, in this case, we c couldn't measure directly the conductances, but we could measure the currents. If we look at the currents uh, as a function of time from before birth to, to P10, we see that initially those values are scattered all over the place, but as we approach um, the, the range in which we saw the gain scaling, all of those values start to converge onto this, of this line of slope one. Now, there's no particular reason they should sit at one. According to our model, anything above one would give us uh, perfectly good gain scaling. This just turns out to be an experimental fact that that ratio tends to hover around one, and that happens to be the ratio that also uh, assures us that neurons are going to do this uh, gain control property. All right, so finally, uh, well, finally for single neurons, how much? When do I have to stop, actually? Okay, great. Wow, I love that. <laughs> you may not. <laughs> so, um, modulatable. So, what do I mean by that? So, what I've talked about at the moment is the case where everything that's coming into the neuron is treated as signal. We can also think about neural computation in a slightly different way. So, a more classic way of looking at the, the behavior of single neurons is through what's called the FI curve, the frequency, the current frequency curve. So, given a certain current of input, if you count the number of spikes coming out, what does that relationship look like? So why is that different from what I've been talking about so far? This is because this is sort of an average measure, right? So we're thinking about the current now as being a slow variable or a, or a constant variable, and we're just counting spikes. What we talked about before was a much more instantaneous measure. Something happens in the input, there's a probability of firing that's, that's time-bearing. This is, this, we're now thinking about computation at a, at a slower time scale. So what I'm showing you is what FI curves look like for a few different um, neurons that have been recorded in the literature from somatosensory cortex, prefrontal, auditory. What's going on with these different curves is that they're being measured in the presence of some background noise. So now we define a mean, but we now also drive it with some background fluctuation. So before the background fluctuation was the signal. Here we're now thinking about it as a background that is not the signal, the, the, the mean is the signal. But now what you see is that as you change the, the variance or the amplitude of that background noise, you change the slope of this relationship between the mean current and the, and the firing rate of the neuron. So hopefully, at least this case should, be, should make some sense. So what, what happens with neurons is they tend to have a threshold for firing, and now as you drive them with some noise, you're going to hit that threshold randomly you know, for values that are below the, the usual threshold of the neuron. So in this case, this, this hopefully should be quite intuitive, that you can change the slope of the, of the sub-threshold relationship between input and output by adding noise. These cases are a bit more dramatic. You see that there's a real change in the slope throughout the, the firing range of the neuron. An auditory brainstem, the case I showed you in the beginning, uh, that is a neuron in which that differentiating component is critical, right? So if you just put in a constant signal, those neurons will not fire at all. They need to see change, right? So that, we, we knew that because we saw that there was a differentiating filter that was that was important for the firing of the cell. That's that case, so that if there's no uh, noise at all in the input, then the neuron doesn't fire. You need to drive it with, with some noisy background in order for it uh, to, to fire. Or across development, so around E18, so embryonic day 18 to P0, you, you see these uh, large waves, and the frequency of them drops off as you approach what we call mature, this day P10. We saw that at the same time, the computational properties of single neurons were changing. And so it was natural to ask whether this change in computational properties could, in principle, uh, influence the, the existence or uh, propagation of waves. So uh, what we did was to build some simple network models where we took neurons that either were what we call mature or immature and drove them with inputs that look what we might imagine a wave looks like. So imagine that neurons are receiving some kind of background, but then a wave would be some kind of correlated uh, you know, increase in the amplitude of the mean coming into those neurons. And let's just have a look at what the firing patterns of a population of the non-gain scaling neurons, so the immature neurons, looks like compared to the, the more mature neurons. So the more mature neurons, because they are um, have this property of sort of automatically normalizing by the, by the standard deviation, 
they fire more readily to the noise. Right? So as this wave comes through, they will fire uh, during times that are not at the peak of the wave. So they are desynchronized uh, compared to the other neurons, so the, the more immature neurons, which all tend to fire in a thresholded way at a particular point during that wave. And so what's the implication of that as we pass through multiple layers of neurons like that, then what will happen, so let's say we imagine putting in a signal that's time varying. These uh, early neurons, these immature neurons, will threshold that input and then propagate it very reliably from layer to layer. Whereas the, game, the more mature neurons, in the beginning, they, the very first layer here you see uh, replicates that input very well. So it's sort of tracking because of this sort of dithering property, right? Because of the fact that uh, it's able to fire at all times, but in a way that's graded by the, by the mean, it makes a pretty good copy in its firing rate of the firing rate that's driving it. So at the f from layer one to layer two, you get a, an almost identical copy of the input. But because it's sensitive to noise, the, 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 uh, the precision of that copy is going to deteriorate from layer to layer because every layer is experiencing noise that's going to disrupt the relationship between uh, the input and the output. And so we start with the first layer has a nice copy, but that relationship gets worse and worse until eventually there's no sign left of this original variation. Whereas here, although it's a, a low res, res uh, um, representation, so you only see uh, responses at these times when it was above threshold, it gets passed very well through the network. So this looks a lot more like wave propagation than what we see here. Right, so just we can quantify that information theoretically, so how much information is transmitted about this, about this time varying input. So our, our non-gain scaling <coughs> network initially in the first layer loses quite a bit of information, but then propagates it quite well from layer to layer, whereas uh, our gain scaling network um, has a lot of information in the first layer, but then that information gets lost uh, through propagation. So we can go back to those input-output curves and do some analysis on them to understand uh, why that's the case. So let's go back and look at what the FI curves for these two neurons look like and how they're modulated by background noise. So before, we were looking at uh, input-output curves in a different sense. We are looking at how they were uh, describing features. Now we want to know what they're doing to that slow-varying input, the, the envelope or the mean. Oh, it doesn't work. There must be something wrong with that slide. Might be this. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to try skipping that slide. Just yeah. Know yeah, you can just go directly there. Is it going anywhere here? <coughs> yep. Okay, great. All right. So what happens is that for those two different settings of the of the sodium potassium ratios we see very different structures of the family of FI curves driven by noise. And in one case, uh, they, the, the gain scaling neurons turn out to have FI curves that all have this property, that they have a single stable fixed point. So what we're doing here is to treat the FI curves as an input-output map. We take the output of one layer, and we're going to propagate it through that FI curve, right? So in the background of whatever noise we're driving the system with. So we take the firing rate coming out, we run it through the FI curve, that gives us the firing rate at the next, at the next layer, and we're going to repeat that from layer to layer as the, as the firing rate is propagating through the network. These, this neuron with this particular setting of the, what we call the, the mature neurons, the gain scaling ones, all of those FI curves have a single stable fixed point. And so what happens is that as the firing rate is propagating through the network, it converges onto this single value, and that's why all the information about the input is lost because it's just collapsing onto, onto a unique value that's independent of the, the way you drove it in the first place. Whereas these, uh, these immature neurons have a whole range where the, F, where the map from input to output is approximately tangent. And so no matter where you started, you end up close to, to where you were. 
So it's not quite tangent. You know, if this were perfect, then this would just have two fixed points and you would converge to those two fixed points. But, but what in fact happens is that as it's moving toward those two fixed points, you synchronize. And so you end up sort of stuck at that, at that firing rate. And so these neurons are able to propagate information about the, about the input firing rate reliably through multiple layers. So what does that tell us? It says that these biophysical properties, right, this single change in ion channel configuration uh, that we see uh, changing between early in development and late in development. So early in development, the, the network is losing information about the fast fluctuations. It's only really responding to these large scale changes. You saw that from the, from the thresholding. It's not really caring about the details of the noise. It's thresholding that information and it's propagating it in this large scale way across multiple layers. So it's preserving information about those slow stimulus fluctuations. Whereas later in development, uh, you maintain the information about these fast fluctuations, right? Because the neuron is a good gain scaler, it's able to preserve information uh, optimally, in fact, about the details in the stimulus. So it ma maintains information about the fast bearing local activity. It also, across one layer, maintains information about the local slow varying activity, but that information is not propagated across multiple layers. You no longer propagate these slow stimulus fluctuations, and so you no longer participate in information conveying waves. And so one way of thinking what that might do is that this might be kind of breaking up the cortical sheet from being purely a sort of large scale information processor that's taking, uh, taking these um, generative waves that are starting in this particular part of cortex and, and moving right across cortex into uh, a network that's processing information much more at a local scale. So now spikes are being generated by fluctuations that are, that are defined locally rather than globally. Right, so if one were able to modulate single neuron properties dynamically by changing the effective um, sodium-potassium ratios, maybe through homeostatic mechanisms or uh, through neurotransmitters that, that act, on those, uh, act on those properties, you could, in principle, affect this mode of network, trans, uh, network function on behavioral timescales. So maybe during sleep and during awake, during alertness and during, um, um, during activity, you could change the network from being this sort of global wave propagator to being something that no longer is able to do that, but instead is working to process information at a much more local level. All right, so just to summarize, what can neurons compute? So what we've seen is that the dynamical systems properties of single neurons lend them a range of different computational properties. We saw integrators, possibility of differentiators, resonators, and even fractional differentiators. Uh, with distinct representations of information at different time scales, that the computational character of the neuron depends on the input statistics via uh, uh, adaptive mechanisms. We saw that neurons are modulatable between different modes of operation. We can change aspects of either their ion channel configuration or of their uh, inputs to take them from being, say, integrating to differentiating or uh, uh, propagating of information versus not and that there's a kind of interplay between these single unit properties and the emergent properties of networks. Right, so what creates this background noise? It's the overall activity of the network. That becomes a statistical signal that gets fed back into the single neuron level that's going to now affect the way that single neuron is, is um, encoding information. And so we really need to think about methods that allow us to kind of move between those different uh, scales, right? So how do we incorporate these single neuron properties into our network description in a self-consistent way where we can predict the activity of the network and see how that's going to affect the intrinsic uh, computational properties of single neurons. All right, so broadly, single neurons provide a complex basis for computation, have many properties that can in principle enrich neural representations. There's a strong relationship between neuronal properties and network function. What I've done here is to start with cases, or a case, where the network has a very straightforward macroscopic behavior. So we talked a lot about sort of computation. So we're able to define that, I think, pretty concretely at the single neuron level. Uh, a wave is a pretty banal computation at the network level. There are a lot more interesting things that you'll hear about uh, later from, uh, from uh, everyone else. <laughs> so um, you know, obviously, neural networks are not just propagating waves. In fact, generally, one would imagine that they want to avoid propagating waves. And so what, uh, what I think would be great to move toward is theories where we're able to uh, integrate the complexities of the underlying biology 
and the computations that are provided by single neurons with our understanding of what networks are able to do at this, um, at this broader scale. All right, thank you, that's it. Bye -bye.